Hello, I'm Dr. Timothy Kowalczyk, head of school at Ascension Classical School in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, today's uh, lecture or discussion or topic is very basic. A few clarifications before I begin. Uh, first of all, this is not meant to be an in-depth uh, lecture in the sense that I'm going to provide a whole lot of resources. This is a primer discussion, meaning that it's just meant to invoke thought and discussion in households and wherever this video is seen. And specifically, what I'd like to do is address the current crisis in American education. And if you've been paying attention to the news, if you've been paying attention to politics and what's happening around the nation, especially with school boards and the controversy surrounding critical race theory, uh, controversy uh, facing transgenderism and what's happening within uh, schoolhouses and bathrooms, and uh, there are a lot of buzzwords uh, that uh, bring up uh, questions about what is happening in American education. And so I'm starting with the premise that there is a crisis, and I don't want to go uh, too, too in-depth into the current crisis. The purpose today is to look more into the origins of the crisis. I happen to believe that what is happening in American education is really not that new. Uh, there have been uh, a series of crises that have led to this moment. This is kind of a tipping point. And Certainly with COVID, what happened in the last two years, uh, COVID kind of just pulled back the curtain and has revealed what has already been happening in education for 50 or 60 years. And my background is as an historian, that's, that's my PhD, and I was a university professor for 20 years. And I could see a lot of this education or these developments in education uh, coming down the road. And that led me to raise the question, well, where did all this come from? How did we get to this current state? How did we get to this point in American education uh, where everybody's kind of raising the question and asking the question, uh, what is happening and what can be done about it? That's the first point is to kind of uh, spend most of my time looking at the history of the crisis and how we got to the point where we are, but also to raise several key points about what I happen to believe is uh, the best solution and that is classical education. Ascension Classical School is a school dedicated to classical education um, and we happen to believe that it is the best form uh, of education. And again, I'm gonna go into, uh, I'm gonna go as deep as I can in a very short video, but uh, I'm hoping that this will raise questions and we would be happy to discuss these issues in person. If you'd like to take a tour of Ascension Classical School or if you would like to uh, visit with me, I'm happy to have a cup of coffee with you and talk about these things and also provide any literature we can about classical education. So with that in mind, I want to start with the origins uh, of our current crisis. And it is my particular theory that the, uh, the, the crisis in American education is rooted in the intellectual crisis of the 20th century. Not the 21st century, not in the past 20 years, but in the 20th century. Uh, by the 1920s, there was a, a very concerted effort um, to change the nature of education. Um, this was happening not only in the United States, but it was happening worldwide. And the, the ultimate uh, start of that, uh, that change in education was rooted in Marxist socialist thought. Now, Marxist socialist is typically associated uh, with politics, and rightfully so. Uh, Karl Marx, the communist revolutions of the early 20th century, uh, Vladimir Lenin, uh, Leon Trotsky, some of these famous names in history, they were about bringing revolution to government and establishing an entire new system uh, and organization of government. But part of their worldview was to eradicate and change everything. You know, the idea of revolution was not just a system of government, it was a revolution of society. And that is critically important because part of the entire change of society had to do with education. If they were going to, if they were going to uh, ultimately uh, change um, the government and change society economically because many people uh, don't realize that not only do they want to change the government, they want to change the entire uh, uh, system of economics, which meant you know, uh, no capitalism and uh, no factories, no, no private or public ownership. Um, but if they were going to succeed in those endeavors, if they were going to train people to come up and adopt 
this worldview. They needed a new system of education. Now, that was happening less so in the democratic countries of the West, but there's no denying the fact that many intellectuals were intrigued by this idea. They loved the idea of, okay, how can we radically transform uh, a society from the ground up through education? Well, that's just the starting point, because the reality is, is that anti or, but the uh, Marxist and socialist um, thinkers of the, of the late 19th century and early 20th century had, had, were really um, an anti-movement. They were anti-religious in the first place. If you read Karl Marx, and the famous quote is he called religion the opiate of the masses. Uh, and his, his, his uh, kind of worldview was, let's pull back the curtain over the eyes or off the eyes of these, uh, these people who have been duped by religion. Um, and then his followers, the famous Marxists of the late 19th century, um, and early 20th century, one of the first things they did when they ever took control was ban religion. So they're anti-religious primarily because they viewed it as an institution that had control. And that is the key to all of these anti-positions that the uh, Marxist socialists had, is they wanted to get rid of all the things that they perceived as control, what controlled an individual, and they wanted to replace it with a system of bureaucracy that they thought was more efficient, more equal and fair. Um, and that's from their perspective. Now, whether those things are true or not is another issue, another debate, and another lecture. All right? But that's how they looked at it, is they wanted to get rid of a whole bunch of established um, um, perspectives in people's lives. They were anti-religious because the church, they thought, had control. It had power. And so, therefore, they wanted to just eradicate it and eliminate it. So they were anti-religious, but they were also anti-family. Um, and this one doesn't get as much press. I mean, communist Marxists thought, okay, anti-religious, we know that because they ban religion. They, uh, uh, they obviously are anti-democracy because they're going to um, you know, throw away the, uh, the democratic governments, you know, et cetera, and the rights of the people, and they're going to establish their own form of government. Those are a given. But in this case, they're also anti-family. They, the, the Marxist socialist thinkers of the early 20th century believe that the family structure just perpetuated um, capitalist thought and democratic thought or dictatorial thought that it perpetuated all kinds of, uh, of misconceptions. And what they wanted to do was replace the family with the state. They believed that an efficient bureaucracy was better equipped to run a family than parents. Um, and that's very important that the idea that this, in the 20th century, this idea that the family really isn't the best unit to raise kids uh, began to creep into intellectual thought. And they were also, as I indicated a second ago, they're anti-democratic, but the, but the point of that is not just a system of government. They didn't believe individuals that uh, had been had living in a society or that individuals who, who may or may not have an education should participate in the bureaucracy unless they had been specially trained, unless they had been educated by the state. <laughs> and so in this case, the, the anti-democracy was, was actually much, um, uh, much more pervasive than just going out to vote. In other words, they believed they had to train and indoctrinate a certain set of individuals to run efficiently the state according to their world view. Um, and uh, again, this is critical because you know, they, the idea was that they started to think about um, how uh, do we officially indoctrinate these people to run the bureaucracy and how do we make sure that no other competing thoughts make it into uh, the educational system. And they had, so in a lot of the communist states that were formed in the 20th century, there was a heavy control of education because again, they had to indoctrinate and keep out uh, competing ideas. Uh, very famously in, uh, in China, in the Cultural Revolution of the 1950s and 1960s, there were re-education camps. That's what they were called. Um, and they brought people in to break down what education they had before, eliminate that competition, and re-educate them according to communist, socialist, Marxist thought. And, and so therefore, that again, that anti-democracy is not just a governmental view, it is an entire worldview that says, we have to eliminate any competing uh, ideas.
And then finally, the, the uh, obviously so, the uh, Marxist socialist thinkers were anti-capitalist. Um, and what that means is, is that they're really anti-individual rights. They're anti, obviously, owning property. They're anti um, the idea of uh, using capital to create wealth. And their, at their attack really was on the middle class because they believe that's what perpetuated capitalism. Um, you know, the middle class has the consumer uh, power to go out and buy goods, etc., which perpetuates the system. But, it, but really, what's behind that is, is they're, they're anti-individual rights because, again, individual ownership, individual participation um, breaks down a bureaucratic control uh, or breaks down uh, the need for the state to come in and regulate everything. And that includes education. Um, they, they really, the Marxist socialist thinkers did not want independent thinkers. They wanted somebody to adopt a worldview and everything go back to that worldview. And so the idea of free thinking, the idea of the liberal arts, which had been the basis of education for 1,500 years uh, in the West, was an anathema. Why would I mean, liberal arts means freedom to practice education the way you want to? Why would they? You know, why would they want that? Man, they want somebody who toes the party line, um, who is dedicated uh, to the party and to the state. If you read that literature of the early communists in the 20th century, that's what they talked about. Um, they, they talked about somebody who gives up themselves and their individual rights for the good of the party, for the good of the state. Um, and, and that took precedence um, over everything else. Um, and that, there's a lot to be said about that, but, but those ideas, again, make their way into... Uh, theories and in, in, in universities, and many people believe this was a better way to live. It was a better uh, worldview, and it obviously leads to the great revolutions uh, of the 20th century. Now, that's the, that's the first um, reality of um, 20th century thought, or just those those ideas of you know anti-religious, anti-family, anti-democratic. All of those ideas just made their way into the university. What is uh, just as dangerous is the beginning of the 1930s all the way through the 1950s there was uh, the adoption of what was called critical theory now not critical race theory um, critical race theory is critical theory just being applied to the subject of race um, and it is the big buzzword right now um, everybody kind of pays attention to it most people have no idea what it is um, it was a theory that was uh, adopted in legal, um, you know, kind of in law schools. Um, it was, a, but it has been applied, uh, you know, across the board in various ways. Um, but the reality is, critical race theory is just one small element of what is called critical theory. Now, critical theory comes from a group of philosophers called the Frankfurt School. Now, the Frankfurt School. Um, is essentially because it was centered in Frankfurt, Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, most of those philosophers fled Nazism in the 1930s and ended up in the United States. And so that's how you see the kind of uh, deep connection. Well, most of these, by the way, these philosophers uh, had many different roles in various universities. Some were social critics, some were critics of literature. Um, so I call them philosophers because they ended up writing uh, philosophical, philosophical treaties, but they also have had elements in the university and many other disciplines. And that's the key point. Their critical philosophy was that you could determine what was wrong with something or that you could uh, break down a new worldview by determining who had power. And they kind of looked at it as uh, whoever had power, well, over time, they become corrupt. And so you criticize something by uh, kind of breaking down who has the power in any situation. Um, and the goal ultimately is to tear down that power, power structure and then rebuild it in a new um, and enlightening way. Specifically, their famous buzzword was, how do we make this more equal? How do you tear down power structures uh, to, to, to become more equal? What is worse, is they believed that if any power corrupted, um, anybody that has power automatically has, and this is the key word, privilege, and so therefore you can't trust them. You can't, um, 
any, anything that has power or anybody who has power um, must automatically be suspect. Now, what's important about that is, is that they took that critical theory and said, this is a theory. We can use this across the disciplines. Um, we can start uh, breaking down um, you know, all of these power structures in political science. Who has the power? Is it the democratic system of a two-party state or is it a one-party state? Uh, how do we break down the powers? How do we break down that? We can look at it in terms of capitalism. Who has the power? Is it mega corporations? Um, okay, therefore we need to tear down the uh, corporate structure. Um, if, is, it in the, uh, is it in media? Does one particular company, is it just two or three companies, do they have all the power? How do we break that down? And what this feeds into is, by the way, this is theory at a high level. This is theory in universities and education and in schools. And um, it, it really isn't something that people are talking about <laughs> you know, on a daily basis. But it fit in perfectly with the anti-establishment mentality of the 1960s. You know, think about the 1960s and all the upheaval that's happening in society and culture. You know, the civil rights movement, uh, the political shifts and changes, the Vietnam War, uh, you know, very much so the hippie movement, um, which was in many cases happening at university level or at, you know, at young or young adult level. Um, they were anti-establishment. In many cases, they didn't know necessarily why, <laughs> but they were anti-establishment. And here you have high-level university professors teaching them that what we need to do is break down the power structure. Um, and that became implicit in many ways. And I'll give you one critical example from, from my field of history. Um, historians began to look at things through the lens of, well, who doesn't have power? Um, and they, they, anything that was traditional, anything that would, had been established in their mind as a power structure needed to be suspect. And you can read that into, well, you know, history had been taught for so many years as glorifying the, uh, the founding of America, glorifying, um, you know, the, 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 the founding fathers and the heroes have been looking at things like the American Civil War, looking at Abraham Lincoln, and they, they believe it was this kind of hero worship. Um, those ideas had power, um, that it was all used for the glorification of the state. And so therefore, what they wanted to do was to teach the truth of the matter and look at it from those that had been persecuted. Look at it from the powerless. And what you get eventually is an historian like Howard Zinn. Now, Howard Zinn was an historian in the 1970s, and he wrote a very famous book in the early 80s um, called The People's History of the United States. And his goal was to write what he called from the ground-up history, from those that had no power, um, those that had been persecuted. And much of our worldview today in terms of history comes from him. Now, think about some of the current trends in history anti-Columbus, anti-American foundations and foundings, the 1619 Project, which is about uh, kind of reestablishing how America was founded. All of those ideas are rooted in this critical theory. And this is dangerous, not because historians shouldn't challenge some of our hero worship, not because they shouldn't criticize heroes, and not because they shouldn't dig critically into the sources. That's not the point. The point is they have just as much a bias and perspective on how history should be taught as anybody else. And they believe it is their job to tear down the, the power structures that be. Now, take that and add that to Marxist socialist thought. Who has the power? Families, you know, certain, maybe certain governments, they're anti-democratic, and so therefore the individual needs to be torn down, shouldn't have any rights. And I'll give you an example. Think about some of the language that you've heard recently about critical race theory. Parents shouldn't have a say in school boards. Well, we want trained bureaucracies to do the education. Um, you know, where, where is this thinking come from? How could anybody possibly have that worldview? Some people are just stunned and shocked. Well, that's been slowly dripping into education for 50 to 60 years. And the evidence of that is not just in what we're seeing now, but think about some of the things that happened in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. There were, you know, one of the first big uh, problems with a discussion about public education was about sex education. And, you know, what, what, what did certain people want to do? They wanted to re-educate Americans on, uh, on the perspective of sexuality by putting it into public schools. We need to put safe sex in the schools because obviously the parents don't know what they're doing um, or they're teaching them the wrong things. Um, and, you know, that's just, that's just one example um, that, that existed in, in that particular period of time.
Then also think about the 1990s, it was the idea of religious liberty. Um, there's the idea of discussion of race in schools. You know, take those different fields, take those different subjects, and think about um, what was happening. They were arguing over who had control over public education. Um, and that, again, has been happening um, on, on multiple different levels throughout the, um, throughout, throughout the last 20, 30 years. And so, you know, there, again, there's a lot to be said about that, but <clears throat> I happen to believe if this is a challenge to, you know, to a person of faith, because all of that is, um, all of those anti-perspectives, all of that intellectual crisis of the 20th century, if it's a challenge to a person of faith, if it's a challenge to, you know, much of what people um, ultimately believe, and if it's a challenge to public education, the question becomes, what is the answer? What is the solution? And I happen to believe that the classical model, and we can have a larger discussion about where that comes from and exactly what that is, I happen to believe that classical education is perfectly suited to address this crisis in education, which is why I'm a head of school at a classical school and why I've kind of dedicated my life uh, to addressing some of these issues. The intellectual crisis of the 20th century can be overturned with a new perspective on, uh, on education. And I say new perspective because classical education is actually a revival of true education in my mind. And I want to very quickly just give as a primer, as a point of discussion, what some of the key points of classical education are and how they address this crisis. Well, first of all, um, classical education is rooted in the idea of truth. And it assumes that truth is knowable and discoverable. Now, much of what happened in the 20th century with the intellectual crisis I just discovered, or just discussed, is that it was really a crisis of truth. All of those things mixed together were questioning the idea that truth can be known in the first place. Um, and there, I remember discussions in the 1980s and 1990s saying, you know, there is no, there is no objective truth. There is no reality. It's all you making it up. Um, and, you know, I kind of laughed at that idea at the time. I mean, it's like, well, of course there's an objective truth. We know gravity, we know science, we know the real world, but philosophers were telling us, no, there is no objective truth. You make up your own truth. You might have heard some of that language. Well, classical education assumes that there is a truth and that it's knowable, and then proceeds to discuss that truth um, and leads to real critical thought and thinking in the sense that we're going to use the tools of education to discover truth. It's about the discovery and idea of truth. And so all classical education is seeking that idea of truth um, and trying to establish and, and set that premise. The second thing that classical education does is that it establishes and defines a real authority. Um, this is one of the beauties of classical schools is that there's a definite authority in the classroom. First it is our faith. It is God, and they teach children to obey and to worship God, teach the scriptures as the foundation of authority, um, teach, um, you know, teach children to read with that idea in mind that there is a God who governs all things, um, and that's the authoritative truth. Um, and that is in every facet of a, a classical school, is there's no wasted motion. Everything has a teaching purpose, from the way they walk down the hall to the art that's hanging in the, uh, in the hallways. It has an authoritative purpose, teaching children about the idea of authority, to obey um, and to listen and to establish a structure that ultimately is dedicated towards, uh, towards truth. And that is a critical element. And so it's God, it's uh, authority in the classroom, but those teachers that they see in the classroom are in direct connection with the family. So really it's about establishing the authority of the family. That God has designed this world to operate within families. That's a direct contrast to that, um, that crisis of the, of the 20th century. That wanted to pick, tear down the structures of the family. Classical education is about teaching families how to educate their children as a family and reestablish that parent-child relationship. Um, and then last in that is government and governmental structure. That we are participants in a democracy, and we're not subjects to a democracy. And that's a big difference. And so classical education, again, perfectly suited for all of that. And the last thing that um, classical education does is it has a foundation of what are called the liberal arts. Now there's a greater discussion about that, and I just said a minute ago what the liberal arts are. Um, liberal, in its original incantation, means freedom. 
And arts is anything that's working for the benefit of, or for the good of something. Actually, for the beauty of something is the original Latin. And so it's the freedom to participate and to think freely as an individual created by God. But what you need first, need first to do is uh, master the tools that God has given us to think in a more appropriate way. And so the seven little arts, the idea of math, the idea of music, the idea of physical education, and I'm not going to go through all the liberal arts here, okay? But the liberal arts are the foundation that will serve you the rest of your life, no matter what endeavor you go into. Much of the Marxist socialist education and much of the uh, capitalist education of the 20th century as well, I'm going to let them off the hook here, was geared towards getting an individual a good career or a good job, either in service to the state or service to themselves. But classical education is about formation of the soul and formation of human character so that when you become an adult, if you choose whatever career it is, you will have a life of virtue. And there's, that's a big difference. How much of American education has been dedicated to just doing well on an exam so that you can get into a college so that you can get a good, good job? That's not formation of the soul. That's not formation of character. Right? That's formation of, of a job. That's formation of... Uh, you know, what they think will provide happiness. Classical education is about having those core liberal arts in your life so that you will have a life of happiness no matter what you do um, in your career or in your life. Now, so, so essentially, as our starter today, I want you to think about the crisis in intellectual education, what you've seen in the news, but then also think about classical education as a possible solution to all of those various um, challenges that, that, uh, that have come, come down um, in our news and in our society recently. Again, this is just a discussion, and if you'd like to get a hold of me, uh, I'm the head of school at Ascension Classes, Classical School in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, and uh, we are on the uh, web. You can just look up Ascension Classical School uh, in Shreveport, and you can find all of our information. And uh, you're welcome to contact me. I'd love to have a discussion with you. Uh, this will be the first of hopefully many short videos like this, um, and we can continue to have a uh, conversation. Thank you, and God bless.